This is the last recording I will do from the Beatitudes. There still will be several postings of recordings I have done previously. But I wanted to let you know, since this is the last time I will talk with you, that what we're planning to do uh, next year, beginning January 13th, I'm going to talk about some of my favorite verses on hope, uh, some verses in scripture that have meant a great deal to me in my own life. Tonight, I want to talk about the final beatitude. Blessed are those who are persecuted, who are reviled, who against whom people utter all manner of false witness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amy Jill Levine may not be a name that you know, but she is a woman, a Jewish woman from Massachusetts. When she went to graduate school, I did to study the New Testament. It's not that she believed Jesus was her savior or Lord, but she had a great interest in the New Testament. I heard her speak one time and frankly, she's intimidating in terms of the way she knows the New Testament. When she talks about the Sermon on the Mount, chapters five through seven of Matthew, she says Jesus is telling us how to live. This is the way that you and I are supposed to live. Now, whether we achieve that or not is questionable because what Jesus taught his disciples and is still teaching you and me is always beyond our grasp. But the fact that it is beyond our grasp doesn't mean that we don't continue to try to follow Jesus. Blessed. That's the way all eight of the Beatitudes begin. It's sometimes translated happy. But we need to define that word happy. It's not happy because everything in life is going the way that you want it to go. It's not that everything is falling in place in your life. Jesus is talking about a happiness that is rooted in relationship to him. Jesus is speaking about a deep-seated joy in life that despite any circumstances that we face, we still feel that blessedness. Brian McLaren, who is one of my favorite writers, combines what I call contemplative prayer with observations about faith. And one of the things he says is that you and I are living in a time of complicated hope. What McLaren means by this is that look at all of the things that are going on in our world. Look at the election. Probably by the time you hear this, the election may be over. But when I'm talking about it to you right now, it's three weeks away. Look at the personal things that our people are facing. We live in a time when so many vile things are uttered against other people, so many personal attacks, so much devastation of the world. That's what Brian McLaren means by complicated hope. It's not that we just focus on one thing and have hope, but you and I are inundated by all kinds 
of personal issues that we face and issues that we face in our nation and in our world. It is a complicated hope. It was a complicated hope for those first disciples who were with Jesus when he spoke these words. You will be persecuted. You will be reviled. People will utter all manner of evil against you. And that's exactly what happened. These apostles, these 12 men who were following Jesus and were listening to those Beatitudes for the first time, they all experienced those things. And even in our world today, in certain places, there are Christian groups that face persecution. And there are groups of other religious uh, faith that face persecution for their expressions of religion. But the fact is that you and I, probably most of us, maybe all of us who are listening to this, we live in a country where I have never been persecuted for, for the sake of Christ. What I have to do is to recognize that maybe there have been some things in my life that have been hard to deal with. And I certainly don't want to make this a parallel to what it means to be persecuted. I remember a time at a church where I was pastor. It was a wonderful church. So many great people in the church. One night in a deacon's meeting, they decided on a percentage raise for the staff. That included the whole staff, custodial, clerical, clergy. I didn't hear anything about what was proposed by the deacons until I went to the finance committee and was met by the chair of the finance committee and also another leader in the church who said, we don't agree with that. And then looked at me and said, we are on the other side from you. Now I should have been wise I think what happened on both ends, we all bear some responsibility. I think on, on the end of the finance committee and this certain leader in the church, there should have been better communication. I heard absolutely nothing in the 15 days between the deacons meeting and their recommendation and what the finance committee and this other leader was saying, I pushed it too hard. Do you know you and I as ministers can push things too hard? Maybe we take it too personally. I'd given a lot to that church. It was a church where my son was diagnosed with his brain tumor, and I had to move through that. I had to deal with some staff issues, and I dealt with them personally. But I had somebody say to me, how can you be a Christian and do what you did? And I had letters that were written to me that said, these were from people who weren't even in the church, autocratic leaders like you, ought to be fired by the churches. I don't think of myself as an autocratic leader. I handle this personally with every staff person. I didn't have a committee between them and me. It came to the church conference and the church voted for the recommendation of the Finance Committee. 
I don't know what the vote was. I don't know what was said because all of the staff, clergy, custodial, clerical, all of us were put in a room in a basement. And so I have no idea what was said. All I know is that what I wanted was lost. I think I said the appropriate things to the church that night. I, I, there was nothing ugly that I said, but I went home and I knew that things had changed. I waited a few days to see if anybody in leadership in the church would call me, not to apologize, but just to check on how I was doing. And I never got that call. I had another church that whose pastor search committee came to hear me. And Diane and I were ready to take a trip to Atlanta. When I had a phone call from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, would I entertain a position as professor of preaching? There was a group of people in this church who gave me the most generous gift I've ever been given when I left. I love those people. But I think I was just overwhelmed by what had happened with David. I couldn't understand because our church was growing. We had gone in five years from a $1.2 million budget to a $2.5 million budget. And this issue amounted to $10,000. And I didn't understand. So I left the church and I had tears in my eyes because I love these people. But it became a blessing for me to teach something that I so much enjoy doing. It gave me time, more time to be with my wife and with David as he finished high school. It gave me more time to reflect, even to write about some of the things that had happened. I hope you will understand, I'm not putting myself in the position of people who are persecuted. I should not have pressed the issue I should have realized that when you go to battle over something that has to do with finances, that is not a good place to choose where to go to war. But things worked out. And I left. And they've had wonderful pastors in that church and a wonderful pastor now. I look back with gratitude that I had time with them, but I also look back with gratitude that suddenly I had this phone call. Would you consider teaching, preaching, And I said, yes. And I was relieved so much. I was at fault. I think maybe they had some fault too. But it worked out. It couldn't have worked out any better. Amen.
Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely accuse you because of me. Because of me. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely accuse you because of me. Because of me. Rejoice and be glad. Rejoice and be glad. For great is your reward in heaven. Rejoice and be glad. Rejoice and be Persecute you and falsely accuse you because of me. Because of me. 